Ask the average person, let's say in um, Santa Monica, do you have a soul? What do you think people will say? Yeah. How many of you would say yes? I think almost everybody would. If you were to ask them, where is it? Would they have an answer? No. What would they say? In my heart. In my heart. Do they mean their heart physically? No. no. So what I want to point out by this is that there's an aspect in everybody which is their essential self, their real self, that isn't physical. So this non-physical self also isn't just a collection of your memories. When you study psychology, people will often try to paint a picture of what being a human is about, in which everything has to do with memory. Everything is about what you experienced as a child. But I want to show you that there's something more. So I'm not saying that this isn't true, but I'm saying is that there's an additional component. What's the additional component? I want you to go back to your earliest memory. Go back as far as you can, three, earlier. I want you to think about all these memories. I'm not going to go through all of you because I did come a couple of minutes late, which is unfortunate. But um, there was a person there. Before all of those later memories came, there was still you. Isn't that true? Okay. So that essential self is what we mean when we say soul. So when you talk about your soul, your soul and your body don't always have the same plans. Could you see where this is so? So there's a famous parable in the Talmud. Once there was a king, and the king had an orchard. Two thieves entered the orchards. They wanted to steal fruit. One of them was blind, and the other one was lame. Okay. So the lame thief says to the blind one, this is the best fruit I have ever seen in my entire life. You don't even know. Like, this fruit is amazing. And the blind man said, I don't know where to get it. And the lame man said, I have an idea. Go on my shoulders. I'll take you wherever you need to go. You pick the fruit, and we'll split it 50-50. Okay, so what's this parable about? It's about the body and the soul. The soul sees everything. It could see from one aspect of reality to the next. This is why we have dreams. This is why we have aspirations. This is why we go beyond today. But it can't get anywhere without the body. There's no such thing as giving if you have no hand. There's no such thing as envisioning if you have no eyes. But the body is completely blind. It lives in the absolute present. And because of this, it has no aspirations beyond pleasure right now. The body lives in the now, and it's oriented towards immediate gratification. The soul lives in the past, in the future, and in the present, and it wants depth. So their agendas sometimes clash. So this um, war between body and soul is what our lives are about. So I want to tell you what the resolution isn't in Judaism. In virtually every other major world religion, the, re, the answer to this problem of the body-soul conflict is negate the body. So were, ever, were any of you ever interested in Eastern religion? If you were, don't say, and Mrs. Heller said we should investigate Buddhism. Okay. Um, if you were, you would see that their entire goal is to be able to silence the body and its desires completely. They see desire as the root of all evil, and the body as the root of desire. So the goal is to silence the body. In Christianity, all Christianity flows from Catholicism, as you know. In Catholicism, the monastic idea 
being celibate, being poor, being in total obedience to the hierarchy was another way of negating the physical world and making it less threatening. Could you see where this is so? I can't resist telling you a joke. I should resist, but I have so little verbal control that it's ridiculous. Okay. So this is, <laughs> I can't believe I'm doing this. Okay. So this goes back a long time. In the Middle Ages, as you know, literacy in the Middle Ages was maintained in the monasteries, right? So there are two monks and they're copying manuscripts, an old one and a young one. The young one looks at the old one and says, you know, I'm a little concerned. I'm copying your manuscript, but what if you made a mistake? I'll be copying it and passing it on. So the old one says, well, there isn't a mistake. So he said, well, how do you know? People make mistakes. And he said, well, we check it against the really ancient manuscripts in the basement of the monastery every so often. And the young one says, you know, I've been here five years. I never saw anyone check anything. Tell me the truth. How often do you check? So the old man looks at him and says, you know the truth? The truth is we never check. But I'm going to go down right now. So he takes the manuscript he was copying, goes down to the basement of the monastery, comes back, his eyes are red, he's been weeping, and the young man said, what happened? You had a mistake? And he said, yes. He says, well, what was it? He said, I wrote celebate, but it says celebrate. Okay, so in any case, so, so Judaism is the religion of celebration. It's the religion in which we say the, the soul can't get anywhere without the body. The body is a gift, treasure it, but don't give it your identity. Take care of it, enjoy it, but don't give it your identity. The body takes you to the world of having. The soul takes you to the world of being. Don't sacrifice being for having. So this is what all of the mitzvot are about. Okay, so now we understand the body and the soul. So with this in mind, we could begin to talk about the afterlife. So now that you understand that the body and soul aren't the same thing, right? The soul isn't the body. As we said at the beginning, if you were to ask someone, where does the soul live? It doesn't live in the body. We use the word heart to mean emotion but not the actual physical heart. So when the body dies, the soul doesn't die because the soul was never the body. The soul was never the body. So what happens to the soul? So when you were children, you may have seen cartoons where, you know, where a roadrunner bops somebody over the head, boing, and then the person turns into an angel. You saw those sorts of cartoons? That's not what happens. Okay. So the best news and the worst news is that whoever you are now, whatever the essential self that is you now, that's who you take with you into the afterlife. Your body is not there. Your soul remains what it is. So I'm going to take you through the death of the total materialist. Now, there really is nobody like the person who I'm making up right now. I'm just making the person up. Okay. So there's a young woman, and you're from Los Angeles, so I'll put her in Los Angeles, okay? She lives in Los Angeles, and she's the total materialist. Could there be somebody like this? Not in Los Angeles, okay. <laughs> so she gets up in the morning. What's her first thought? First thought of the day if you're living only with the body. No? What am I going to wear? What am I going to wear? Okay. So she gets out of bed. She goes into the closet. Notice I didn't say opens the closet. I said goes into the closet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, you know, she chooses her outfit, okay, puts it down on the bed. Next thing. Makeup. No. Shower, please. <laughs> shower. And there are choices to make. What are some shower choices? Come on. Which shampoo do I use today? Which shampoo? Okay. Conditioner. Conditioner. Okay, the whole thing. Yeah. Body, the whole thing. This, this is, you've got it. Okay. And then you throw something on, not the outfit you're wearing for the day, just like something, because now you have to go sit down and eat breakfast. Okay, what's for breakfast? Half a grapefruit. Half a grapefruit. <laughs> You've got it. <laughs> okay. And if you want to drink something, what goes with it? Green juice. Green juice. You've got it. Please. This is, you have to watch, you know, like, okay. Born and okay. raised in LA. What? Born and raised in LA. Yeah. Okay, so next, 
you can't get dressed yet either. You have to work out first. Okay, so you work out in your home gym, and then you take your second shower, which is like shorter. Now it's time to get dressed. You get dressed, but that's not, it's not enough to put your clothes on. Something else must be done before you're ready to face the world. Makeup. Makeup. How long is that going to take? This whole thing up to where we're up now. And when she opened her eyes until the makeup's finished. How long are we talking two about? Hours, this could hours. easily be two and a half hours. Could it be longer? Could be longer. It could be mumish. It could be longer. But two and a half hours would be now. If it's Monday, Wednesday, or Thursday, she has a morning plan. It is her personal trainer or her psychologist on alternative days or yoga or ceramics. Any other possibilities? Okay, now it's time for shopping. Okay, now the afternoon activity is shopping. Okay, and then maybe meeting friends again, this time for coffee. And then it's time to go home, take another shower, because now it's time to get dressed for night. Like, what are you going to do at night? Go out for dinner. Go out for dinner, or dancing, or a pub, or all three. Okay, clear? <laughs> okay. Are there people who live like this, more or less? Okay, so now there's really no one who's this two-dimensional. I just want to make, I want to make, stay honest, but there are people who are not so far. Okay, so here it is. It's 4.30. What's she up to? PM. PM. What was, what? Is it time? Not yet, that's five. Uh -oh. She's, shopping. She's, she's shopping. shopping. Okay, and she sees it, it from across the street in Bergdorf's. I just forgot the name of the branch who I wanted with red with red soles. What are they? Louboutins. She sees Louboutins and they're on sale. <gasps> half price. Okay, how much will they be half price? Fifteen hundred dollars. No, that's nine hundred. It's half price. Okay, <laughs> Louboutins for only you heard me only nine hundred dollars. And they're the right color. What's the right color? Black. Black. Matte black Louboutins with those red soles. Only 900. So she's like, she's worried, like somebody else may get, she hurries across the street. She didn't look both ways. Oh no, the bus. She's gone. Okay. Okay, so now we can begin talking about the afterlife. Okay. <laughs> gone? She's gone. She's dead. She's, it's over. The story is over. Okay, <laughs> so what happens to her? Her body is gone. So now I want to tell you how what happens after death is narrated both in our sources, Jewish sources, and in non-Jewish sources, because up to a certain point the story is the same story and then they diverge. Okay, have any of you read um, any of the non-Jewish sources on life after death? Okay, so here's what happens when a person dies. Many, many people have been interviewed who had near-death experiences. What a near-death experience is, is when a person, either through illness or through an accident, is clinically dead, meaning they have no signs that the doctors can detect, and they're somehow resuscitated. Now, between when they're declared clinically dead and their resuscitation, people have unusual experiences. So these have been documented, and I want to tell you the most important kind of documentation. Not only from one society, also in the Western world and also in Africa, and not only adults, but also young children. But kids haven't read the books, so they don't know what the right answers are. So if you say, what's the right answer, you know, okay, but they don't know the right answer. And everyone tells the same story. So the story has several chapters. Chapter one, when a person is clinically dead, even if their eyes are closed, they're aware of what's going on around them. They could tell you afterwards who was there, what they were saying. They have full awareness. And this awareness is why, according to Jewish law, when a person dies, you have to treat the body with respect because there's a premise that there's still awareness. So in halachic Judaism, what happens when a person dies is whoever is with them is supposed to close their eyes, cover their face with a sheet. Why? So I want to tell you why. Have any of you ever seen a dead body? How does a dead body look different than someone who's asleep? 
definitely greater peace and definitely no animation. There's no soul there. And you could tell that there's no soul there. So in a certain sense, the seeing thief is no longer there. All that's left is the blind thief who doesn't know what's happening, who's inanimate. Okay, so the next step. The person finds themselves drawn through a tunnel. In every possible culture, they talk about a tunnel. They're drawn towards the tunnel and they begin to walk through. As they walk through this tunnel, they see their entire lives. I once heard this like amazing interview on Israel radio. There was um, a young Ethiopian fellow who was a policeman. This took place around eight years ago. There was the Arabs threw an explosive on Strauss Street downtown. He saw this happened. He threw himself on the explosive and he took the shock of the explosive with his body and he survived, which is a great miracle. So he had a long and difficult recovery. But he was being interviewed. So the interviewer had an agenda. The interviewer's agenda was to get him to say something political, but I want to tell you what actually happened. He said, and what were you thinking when you saw the man throw the explosive? What were you thinking? So he said, my first thought was, I better do something because I'll die anyway. So, and when you threw yourself on this explosive, what do you remember next? Now, the right answer for his purposes would have been waking up in the hospital. But that's not what the man said. He said, I remember being drawn to a tunnel. I could see my whole life. I was back in my village in Ethiopia. I could see my grandfather, and he's been dead many years. I saw my whole life. So the interviewer didn't like where this was going. <laughs> so he said, well, what do you think the government should do to prevent this kind of terrorist activity in the future? And he said, you didn't get what I'm saying. There's something bigger there. I saw the whole thing. And the man said, well, do you think that the Likud is doing enough? And he said, it's not about that. It's about, OK. And then like the two ships sort of you know, went on their way in different directions. But what I'm telling you is the people who were really clinically dead, not just seriously injured and are resuscitated, all speak about this tunnel. And sometimes people are resuscitated very rapidly. Sometimes it's just an hour, less than an hour, sometimes more. It could be days or even months. But they all tell the same story. And even people who are resuscitated right away recall having seen their whole lives, which is like certainly something that's not natural. OK, what's the next step? The next step after and this is, again, in our literature and in theirs. The people see what they'll describe as something beautiful, light, a source of pleasure. And in different cultures, they'll use different vocabulary to describe what pleasure is. And they're drawn to it. Now, people who come back to life, people who are resuscitated, obviously didn't follow this all the way to the place where there's no return. Then the people who are resuscitated say, but the pull drawing me back here, my family, my whatever, was stronger than my desire for this pleasure, and I was able to come back. The people who were not able to come back or who didn't want to come back obviously can't be interviewed. Okay? So I want to point out, and that's where our stories diverge, okay? because in the non-Jewish world, that's as far as the story could go, because they could only interview people who came back. What happens next, though, and what was happening until now from a Judaic perspective? So the soul left the body behind. It's the soul sees the whole story, the whole life, their whole life. And um, how, if you were to see your whole life, I'll give you a half a minute to think about it. And I'm not going to ask you for it. Let's share. OK. Are there moments that you would like to delete? I want you to think about the moments you would like to delete. I'm giving you half a minute. Again, I'm not going to ask you to share this. It's far too personal. I would never do such a thing. But I'm going to ask you one thing. These moments you would like to delete, are they painful for you just by thinking about them? How many of you would say that they are? OK. So 
I want to tell you about a process that you may not know about. All of this is spiritual. The way God created the world is that there is a delete button, but it could only be activated here. Once a person is dead, it can't be activated any longer. So this delete button could only be pressed after three things take place. You admit to yourself and to God what was wrong. You see, because if you don't know what's wrong, there's no way to press that button. The next is after you admit to yourself and to God, this wasn't where I wanted to be. You let yourself recognize that the painfulness of, us, of it is because you recognize that this bad choice, whatever it was, was painful to you, not just to anyone else who you may have harmed. And the third thing is that you resolve honestly to live a life in which this is not going to recur, which means you have to think through why it recurred and what you could do to change. But once you do this, the magic that God puts in is that the delete button is pressed. So you don't have to revisit those places. But I want to tell you something very interesting about the way life is here. When you're going through this tunnel, time doesn't exist, so you see everything. In this world now, we forget everything. It's like we, we, we have chronic Alzheimer's from when we're born. Everything is forgotten because new things arise. So I want to illustrate this to you. Imagine you found the right guy, and he loves you, and you're getting married, and you look gorgeous, and you're facing him at the ceremony, and his mother even likes you. If you're fantasizing, why not? Okay. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you know, and would you be very happy at that moment? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's say you have a good marriage. I'm not talking about a bad marriage. You have a good marriage, but it's eight years later. You're sitting across the table from him. Now, remember, he was just as good as you thought he is. Are you thinking about how marvelous it is to be married from him on an av to him on an average day? No, you're thinking about whatever else is going on in your life. So we forget our noble moments. Our bad moments are easy to recall, but our noble moments and our, and our joyous moments are easily erased. So I want to tell you something that actually happened. When my son, my oldest son, was 15, which was a long time ago, um, he was a junior counselor in a camp. And the camp was, go the camp was here in Israel. They were going out in nature. And part of, the, uh, part of the trail involved going over a little wooden bridge over a stream. The campers were 10 years old. So some of the campers fell off the bridge. Be a little boy, what does that mean? Jumped. Jumped, okay. Now here's what they didn't know. There was a, wool a whirlpool under the bridge. So the boy who jumped in was immediately drawn under by the whirlpool. The counselor jumped in after him because he didn't know why the kid wasn't coming up. And he was drawn in. My son saw this. He realized what must be happening if the counselor can't get out of the water. He grabbed a big branch, and he was able to pull them both out. OK, so that, could you see where that could be one of the most important things a person does in their life, one of the most meaningful things? It was a big deal. It wasn't, oh, thank you, thank you. It was, you know, you know, a certificate and the parents and this. It was a very big deal in its time. Now he's in his early 40s. How often do you think he thinks about this? He has mortgage payments. He has to deal with the orthodontist. He has to think about, you know, like he has other things on it. He has a career. How often do you think he thinks about this? Probably never, except maybe, like, say, I know him. Maybe right before Yom Kippur, when he's thinking about, like, where's my life taking me? But otherwise, never. And the reason isn't that more important things happen. It's just that more things happen. So I want to tell you one of the big surprises you're going to get after you die. You did far more good than you imagined that you did. A lot of the good that you've done has been forgotten. And good is never erased. So what happens then? You get to this place of goodness, of light. So everything that you did that was good stays with you. But there's the other stuff as well. So you are who you are. So people, when they talk about 
words that one is never supposed to use because they're so unpolitically correct, heaven and hell, it's not what you think. Let's talk about hell first because I'm from Brooklyn and I tend to be negative and that's where I always flow, okay? <laughs> um, are we talking about something physical? Would that make sense? Make me a case for it would make sense. Make me a case for it wouldn't make sense. For hell? Yeah. A physical hell with fire, pitchforks, devils like Dante. Okay, so you see it as making sense. Anybody else sees it as not making sense? So I want to tell you something. The body is buried. There is no physicality for the soul. All of these images that you have are images, some of which were painted by the prophets, to describe the vast painful humiliation that we face if we live bad lives. So I want to illustrate to you what I mean by this. Everybody who's here any amount of time goes to the Tachana, the big bus terminal. They buy a card. Oh, yeah, we have that. You have cards? Yeah. You can go on the train with them. You can go on the bus with them. Okay, now, you have, there are two kinds of Rav Kavs. One is the kind you probably have, which are anonymous ones, right? No picture. Okay, there are cheaper ones, but they, the bus company doesn't want you to pass them on to your whole family. They have your picture. So most Israelis have their Rav Kav, which they hold on to for dear life. Okay, clear? Okay, so you get on the train and you realize after you're on already, you forgot your Rav Kav in your other purse. What's going to happen to you if the inspector catches you? Aha, uh -huh. no. This is, this is Israel. He's not going to just say, ma'am, off the train. Yeah, there'll be a scene. You've, this is Israel. Maze! You know, like, and you know, and why, why don't you have it? And you have to be a thief for 650. And what's your problem? And there's a big fine, 180 shach. Okay, it's a big deal. Okay, clear? But it's not just the money, it's also the humiliation. Yeah? So let's say you left your whole wallet at home not just the Rav Kav. How many of you could picture getting off the train and walking wherever you have to go on the chance that an inspector may get on the train and humiliate you? How many of you could picture doing it? He may get on, he may not go on, but if he gets on, there's going to be a scene. Okay, clear? So those of you who can, the reason that you can is that most people will go pretty far to avoid humiliation. Could you see where this is so? So I want to tell you something important about humiliation. The more you believe in yourself, the more you love yourself, the more painful humiliation is. So I want to illustrate this to you. Okay, rape is a terrible crime. We'll all agree on this. Is it the physical reality of rape that's so terrible? Is that why it's such a terrible crime? No. No. If a man who um, committed a rape was to go before a judge and he was to say, look, I gave her a bad 10 minutes, I'm willing to have a bad 10 minutes, would anybody go for that? No. It's the humiliation. It's the feeling of being nothing, of being totally disempowered. You could see where this is so? So in the other world, the humiliation of knowing that you aren't who you could have been is that severe. And this is why, by way of illustration, they'll talk about the pain of fire, the pain of ice. It's all allegorical, but it's real. So there are two allegories that are used. One is fire, one is ice. So I want to talk to you about fire for a moment. A little while back, I made you go back to your bad moments. Were there bad moments that were fire-like? screaming, yelling, anger, maybe violence. Did you ever have any moments like this in your life? Not us, but you know people who have, okay. But there's also moments of ice, cutting someone off, ignoring them, not feeling anything for them. In Hebrew, the word for cruel is achzar, which is actually two words combined. The word ach means only, and the word zar means foreign. Achzar is when you treat somebody as though they're not part of you, they're not part of your planet. Once you see somebody as totally estranged, you could do anything for them, to them. 
So there's the hell of fire, there's the hell of ice. But there's also the reward, the reward for being who you are, the feeling of connection. So I want to illustrate that to you. Think of your favorite food. That should be easy. How long does the pleasure last? It lasts as long as you're eating and then it's gone. It's real. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not saying it's all illusion. Okay, it's real, but it's short because it's shallow. It's the pleasure of the body. Would you say everybody in the world knows this? That, and this is true for all physical pleasure. It's all real, but it doesn't last very long. Would you say everyone knows this? No. So I want to tell you something. Everyone knows it here. Very few people know it emotionally. The people who are willing to learn this emotionally, which is not everyone, still want this because it gives immediate pleasure, but they want more. Now, in contemporary Western society, the next address for pleasure seeking is in beauty. Having gorgeous clothes, living in a marvelous house, great trips, um, art, music, dance, all of this is called aesthetic pleasure. What's your favorite, ple what kind of beauty do you like the best of all of the things I just mentioned? Art, dance, music, travel, travel, that's, we're on the same. Any of you hike? Uh, okay, ain, ain, that's the best. Okay, so you're there? So if even that kind of pleasure lasts longer, could you see where this is so? The pleasure of the great hike lasts longer than the great hike. Could you see where this is so? Okay, but only to a certain degree. You know, think about your dream outfit. You go to the store, perfect outfit, perfect price, perfect color, perfect everything. Where's it going to be in five years? Trash, okay. And I want to tell you why. All of these pleasures, even though they're for sure deeper than coarse physical pleasure, they're still about having rather than about being. So do you think everybody knows that? That these pleasures don't last forever? Does everybody know that? No. If everyone knew this, you would never have this happen to you. You're walking down the street, and you see um, what seems to be a teenager. Then she turns around, and it's an old lady. Did you ever have that? Yeah. Ah! <laughs> okay, you know. So, <laughs> yeah. So I'm just saying, beauty doesn't last forever. No, no. Okay. So where most people will go if they acknowledge that, that it's about being and not just having, they, they'll want most of all the pleasure of relationship. So I want you to think of the person who you like the best. I'm not going to ask you who it is. You there? But I'm going to ask you something else. I'm not going to ask you who it is. I'm going to ask why you like that person. Why do you like the person you like the best? Are these qualities of the soul, or are they qualities of the body? Soul. The soul. Now, I want to ask you one more question. Suppose when you're with that person, you feel the way you describe them as being. You feel strong, and you feel courageous, and you feel compassionate, you feel understanding, and you feel like you get them. Do you like them even better? So the name of that feeling is spiritual bonding, which is the highest pleasure there is. It's soul-to-soul -soul pleasure. So remember at the beginning of the class, I asked you what a soul is, and you said it's a person's essence. So I want to tell you a little bit more. The soul is the aspect of you that's a breath of God. So what you love in your, in your fellow person, who you, the person who you love the most, is their soul, which is their godliness. That kind of bonding is what the future life is about. So the more that you did in this life to give expression to your higher self, the greater your pleasure is there. And we can't always get it because, again, in this world as it is, time keeps on pushing away pleasure. So you could do things that are noble and beautiful, and you forget it because somebody stepped on your foot. Okay, But it's not that way there. That's your eternity. So I want to ask you to think about something. And again, I'll give you 30 seconds. I want you to think about the most noble thing you've done in your life. I want all of you were able to think of something that you did that you're ashamed of. 
So I want to point out to you, isn't that interesting? That the part of us that's self-critical hides our nobility. You've done noble things. I have no doubt about this. You're seekers, otherwise you wouldn't be here. But the part of you that's self-critical conceals this. Part of your job here is to recognize your nobility and see your capacities. What's the word you would use to describe this? The deed is that she nursed her friend back to health for two months. What's the word you would describe? That was an act of, don't say nobility. Compassion. Compassion. What else? What is, what's, patience. So I just want to conclude by telling you this. People confuse themselves. So you gave an extremely good illustration. The word Aryan, which means people of light, okay, define themselves through courage. But in our own times, or at least in my times, you will have memories still of Nazism, where they considered themselves a superior race, and they considered courage killing other people, inferior people, us. So what the Torah does for you is it gives you a guide map it tells you where to put all of this part of you that's noble and good in a way that's real. So my bracha to you is that you continue doing things of beauty and nobility and that you have wonderful portions in the future life. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you.